Lord Fleming here in France. It's not quite so sunny today, but it's nice still, you know. So I'm here today because we were talking about uh, postmodernism and the idea that if there is some kind of innate benchmark that we can refer to, then all the ideas of postmodernism go out the window. And I'm arguing that there is. So what is that? What is that thing? Um, there is a branch of philosophy called aesthetics, which is basically the consideration of beauty. Um, I've just been reading Thomas Aquinas on this. And he basically sees beauty as being a form of perfection, and it has to do with that which is given by God, because Aquinas is a, an apologist, he's probably the, one of the greatest Christian apologists who ever lived, and certainly a very prolific one. I'm not talking about that. So that's the first thing to put aside. The, the thing I'm talking about is not beauty per se. I think beauty is part of it, but I don't think it's identical or synonymous with beauty. It's a function of, of being in touch with the, a part of your brain that understands the difference between that which is good and that which is bad. Okay. But it's not necessarily aesthetics. Aesthetics is very much influenced by culture, although I would argue that it has its roots, or it is a part of this greater understanding that I'm talking about, so there are definitely universalities within the notion of aesthetics. But, I mean, and it's not to do with what kind of painting you like. Um, I happen to like Rothko. An awful lot of people out there hate Rothko. You know, they'll go, it's the colour field guy, you know, uh, big red canvases. Um, you stick me in front of a, a Rothko on a, on a rainy day, I'll happily sit there for an hour just looking at it. You know, and it'll, it, it'll sing to me, it's fine, I'll, 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 get the, I'll get off on that, you know, meditative thing. So, so, what I'm talking about isn't really about beauty. We've often considered Aquinas' his idea of beauty was that it came from God. Uh, I was reading recently, I've taken it upstairs, um, Desmond Morris again. Desmond Morris is a very world famous anthropologist, television presenter, internationally reputed painter himself. He was a very important futurist, leader of the British futurist movement. Um, general all round Renaissance man and, and thoroughly nice bloke. I met him once many, many years ago and an absolutely charming guy. An immensely, immensely smart person. <laughs> <laughs> if he weren't so nice, he'd be really intimidating, you know, <laughs> because he's, well, what a brain. Um, but he talks in some, one of his books, he talks about how perhaps our idea of aesthetics is drawn from the responses of a baby to its mother, for example, and seeing the, the, the maternal face. And he's suggesting that maybe there are things there that we go, right, we fix on that, you know, we, we, that imprints on us and it informs our understanding of beauty. And yeah, I can get that, and I think that certainly may well be true in terms of how uh, men in particular respond to women. You know, I mean, I, yeah, I would get that. Perhaps our, one of the things that informs our ideals of feminine beauty is, is that notion of looking at the young, your young mother, you know, because uh, she's presumably going to be young when she had you, stuff like that. Uh, but these are all kind of Disparate, different things. Uh, I, I want to talk about, you know, for example, here. This here is not a thing I don't think that you would call beauty. All right? Okay, so you see my face. I don't think anybody's going to call that beautiful. Right? That's an S24 ounce hammer. And trust me, nothing knocks in nails like this thing does. I've had it for, oh, I guess 25 years. Um... It is a wonderful thing. It might not look beautiful, but it's wonderful. It has something special. Now this here, I just brought these couple of things to show you. I'm sure you can see it. Um, this is my favorite violin bow, right? I guess this one is about 50 years old. Maybe a little bit older. It's kind of difficult to tell. It could be an older one. I've had it re-haired, obviously. Um, it's a lovely thing. It, it's got in a, a, just such a delicious balance, you know? And, and when you play with it, it's, it's, it just... But are you going to look at that and tell me that that thing is beautiful? I'm going to suggest that you wouldn't. 
So what we're talking about, this nub, this commonality that we all have, that allows us to tell what's good and what's bad, it's not, it's not actually about beauty. It's something else. Is it truth? Well, no, it's obviously not truth. Can't be truth. Uh, here you go. We showed you this one before. The Silmarillion. Sorry, the Silmarillion. There's not a word of truth in it. It's still really good. It's total fiction. If, uh, if we're, our estimation has to be truth, then you have to have a particularly you know, hmm. you have to have a modified understanding of what truth is to include things like that. And when you go down that line, that's when you end up with uh, postmodernism bullshit. So there's something else. There's something else that lets us know what's good, what's not good. Now, unfortunately, I don't have the book here. I lent it to my son. He hadn't given it back. You know what sons are like. If you have any, you, you, you'll, you'll know. So my hair's all over the place. Book by a guy called Robert M. Persig died quite recently, just uh, last month, I think. Only ever wrote two books. He was not a philosopher. He was a computer programmer. Uh, he wrote two books, and the, his first and most important book was called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, and this should be required reading for everybody. Okay? It's not an easy read. I warn you. It will take you two or three goes to really start to, to get it. Persig was bothered by the same things as are bothering me here, and it is entirely possible that it's reading Persig, that, which I first did around about 1977, I guess, when the book came out, that has informed so much of my thinking about this over the, the last 30 years. What we're not talking about is aesthetics. What we're not talking about is truth. We're talking about something else that can enca encapsulate these things right? But doesn't necessarily. Yet it's something that we all recognise. Something that we go, yeah, well, that's it. Obviously, that's it. You know, that. You think, hmm. Yes. Persig called it quality, right? And he said it was at the, the, the cutting edge of not only perception, but reality. So in a way, at that point at which you go, bang, they come together. And he said, that's quality. But he said, the problem is, soon as you try to define it, it's gone. You just try and get hold of it, it's gone. Where is it? What is it about this that you go, yeah, that's good. Is it its weight? Its balance? Is it the way it's been cast, shaved? It's, it's actually forged, shaped? It's all of those things and none of those things. It's quality, right? We can all understand quality and it doesn't matter where it came from, or what its cultural background is, because this is a universal constant. That's basically what Persig was saying in this wonderful book, which is a kind, it's one of these ones that uses a, a, the narrative device of a journey. He calls it a Chautauqua, which is a, a, basically a, a narrative journey. It's telling, telling the story of, of a travel. The Lord of the Rings is a very long one of these. It's, it's just a very common device, literary device. Look at... Um, Dante's Divine Comedy, same thing. You, you narrate the story that you want to tell within the context of the story of a journey because that gives you a, a continuity that holds everything together. Even when you're trying to make quite disparate points, you can always link back to the idea of the, the journey. And the, journey, the physical journey that Persig takes is uh, back to his uh, place in, called Bozeman, Montana, where he had a a nervous breakdown thinking about all this stuff. I don't blame him, by the way, because it's complicated. And within it, within the description of this physical journey, he talks about the philosophical journey of the mind that he's also engaged in, in his tracking down and discovery of this thing called quality. And in the end, he says it burns him out. He plays the role of a character called Phaedrus, a philosopher, a rhetorician called Phaedrus. Um, and he says in the end, it burns him out. But he's left knowing that he's seen it, knowing that he has understood it. And I think that he's right. And I think that it's something that, it doesn't matter how much we talk about it, we can't actually define it. But we know it, right? <laughs> you know, it's a really complicated thing. You can't define it because you use words. But you still know it, right? Because it's something that exists much deeper 
inside the human psyche than, than words can actually get at, you know? It's kind of like the night terrors. How do you describe the night terrors? You can't, because it's primeval. It comes before language. And what Persik is essentially saying is you can't define quality in terms of language because quality comes before language. You know? So how could you do that? You know? He starts off talking about motorcycle maintenance, about fixing motorbikes, which quite honestly is a fairly practical, rational way of doing things. He describes scientific method in terms of diagnosing problems of motorcycles that don't run properly. Right? Uh, and he, did, he does it beautifully. <laughs> you know, if you read that book, then you, you will understand how scientific method works in, in terms of developing a hypothesis, using an experiment to test it, seeing if you were right or wrong, in terms of being methodical, in terms of tracing problems through. Yeah, Persing does all that. He's not some sort of touchy-feely, airy-fairy, postmodernist, new age, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> horror this guy is a guy's guy he knows what, what, what he understands that beauty is not just feminine things beauty is also masculine things like hammers you know he understands that the whole thing is not just about beauty it's about an independent quality which informs so quality in a certain way seen in a certain way will appear as beauty it might appear, however, as things that are absolutely not beautiful. Um, a very good example, I'll try and use the space up here again to show it, is a painting called Guernica by Pablo Picasso. And Pablo, this painting shows the bombing of Guernica by uh, Franco's allies, the Germans. One of the very, I think the first time that uh, civilian targets had been bombed in this way by, for the purpose of striking fear into them indiscriminate civilian bombing. And the painting is very ugly. You would not stand in front of me. It's huge, by the way. You, you, you would not stand in front of it and say, gosh, that's gorgeous. But it's good. It's a great painting. And we can think of, gosh, it's so many paintings like that, that they're definitely not beautiful, but they're still good. Because they express their quality in a way that is not beauty, but they still have the quality. Right? And there's just loads of that. Um, bullfighting. Bullfighting is a good example. Westerners like me, North people from the North, Western cultures, we tend to be very like, oh, bulls, oh God, bullfighting. Have you ever seen a bullfight? You ever seen a bullfight? I have. You can't help but be stimulated by it. You just can't. It's, it's like it's beyond your your conceptions. It's, 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 it's both more terrible and more frightening and more strangely elegant than you can possibly imagine if you've never seen one. It's visceral. And I can see why Hemingway, I'm still there, Hemingway, Hemingway, great American author who lived in uh, Spain at the time of the Civil War. I could see how he, very masculine guy, kind of responded this, to, to this and went, yeah became a big part of his life. He was always a, a fan of the bullfight after that. This is because it has quality. You might not like it. I don't say that it's a question always that you will like it in the sense that it will fit into your predetermined moralistic standards. I'm just saying it has quality. I'm just saying it's good. That if you watch the way that the, the bullfighter fights to turns the bull, don't tell me this guy is not good. Don't tell me, because he is. So what I'm talking about is not the conventional aesthetics of beauty. It's the appreciation of what is good, right? And I'm saying that we all have it. Not just that we all have it. I'm saying much more than that. I'm saying that not only do we all have it, it's something that transcends culture. So it doesn't actually matter which culture you come from you still know what's good. What I'm saying is we do have that understanding. That reality does exist and it's called quality. I don't always rant on about Persic, but I think you should read it. Mm -hmm.